Well, good morning. I am uh, so grateful to be here with you guys this morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you for um, just being present this morning. And uh, I, I definitely want to, uh, before we jump in, we're going to uh, turn to a word of prayer, open this time up with God. And I also want to make sure we just take a special moment as well to just pray, pray for JP and his family, um, just in the midst of everything going on. So uh, if you guys would just join me as we go before God. And, and just ask him to invade this space. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your love, your affection that you pour out on each one of us. And God, we thank you for the opportunity for us to be present here this morning, Lord. We pray for those who are not able to be here this morning, whether because of sickness or busyness, conflicting schedules, whatever it is, Lord, that you would still encourage those members, those who are a part of this church family, God. And we take a, a, a space, Lord, to just pray for JP and his family, Lord, for health and recovery. And God, I thank you um, that you might choose me this morning to be able to speak, God, but I ask that you would invade this time, Lord. Do not let a word come out of my mouth that is not from you. Interrupt any agenda that I might have that is not yours, Lord, and that only your word would be spoken through, and only we would only hear your voice, God. And that in this morning, in this time, in this space, we, we would consider the depth of the gospel, the depth of your love, Lord, and we would be changed and we would be transformed by it. Father, thank you for your love, your encouragement, your power and grace in our life. We invite your spirit this morning. Pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, as JP said, um, this morning we kick off a new series, The Content Life, and in it we're going to be going through uh, the book of Philippians. Um, if you are not familiar with the book of Philippians, the Philipp, the, this book is rich, it is full of, of, of a message about finding joy, finding contentment, finding purpose in the midst of, of sometimes challenging or, or, or a trial in our life. And, and part of what makes this book so beautiful and so rich is its context, right? It's well known that this book was written, it was penned during a time when Paul, the author, was in prison. And he was imprisoned for, for, for preaching the gospel, and now he is writing this letter to this church, and it's full of this message of finding joy, finding contentment, finding peace, Freedom from anxiety, finding purpose, despite the conflicts that we might have. So we're going to just dive right into it. We're going to jump right into it. We're going to be reading Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to read the first 11 verses. So if you guys have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there with me. If not, it's going to be on the screens to, to, to the left and to the right of me. But kick it right off. And in verse 1, it says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy People in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Together, the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a, ge a general intro to, to the letter. Paul pretty much starts all of his letters this way. He just says, Hey, I'm Paul, and I'm writing you to you, uh, whatever church that is. And in this case, it's to Philippi, and he's just addressing specifically the leaders of that church, the deacons and the elders. And then his intro kind of continues on. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership. And the gospel, from the first day until now, and being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's saying, thank you. Thank you for partnering with me in the gospel. Thank you for being busy and serving Jesus. I can see that God is forming you. He is shaping you. He is molding you. And I'm confident that he will finish that work. That you will continue to be useful to God's kingdom. He is uh, effectively recognizing and appreciating his, this church. 
And then he says, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending uh, and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me, God can testify how I long for all of you with this affection of Christ Jesus, right? Now just recognize here, there's a couple of places where, where Paul uses this uh, uh, verbiage that he is saying like, I have this deep care for you as a church. I thank my God and when I think of you, I hold you in my heart. God as my witness, I yearn for you. Now sometimes when we, when we read Paul's letters, like in the first few verses, you get a sense of where he is going, whether he's encouraging the church or whether he's trying to correct the church, right? It's just like when you sometimes sit down and you have a serious conversation with someone, they're like, hey, can I have, can I have a talk with you? And in the first few moments of that conversation, you have a general idea about whether or not it's going to be a good conversation or a heavy or hard conversation. And Paul's starting out by saying all these nice, encouraging things, right? But Paul doesn't always start that way. I mean, you look in like Corinthians, for instance, he's like, oh, Corinthia, <laughs> right? Or he gets into 2 Corinthians, he's like, I have to write to you again, right? Right, and there's these errors, these problems, and that's not what he's doing here. He's starting off by just lavishing them with compliments, encouragement, joy. I care about you, right? So much of what he's saying here says, I care about you. You as a church have a special place in my heart. So keep that in mind as we read this very next part. He's saying, I care about you. And then he says, this is my prayer for you. Picking up in verse 9. He says, this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth and of insight so that you may, may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Uh, he, he is praying that this church would become more loving, that they would have discernment so that they might be able to evaluate their life in order to, to, to figure out how to make it even more excellent. Excellent. And then he prays for the righteousness that comes uh, from Jesus. And this kind of could mean two different things. It could be like that righteousness, that, that internal righteousness, that what we call justification, that God makes us righteous inside, but also this righteousness that comes uh, outside in our actions and our behaviors. This process of sanctification, that God makes us more holy. And he's just praying, I pray that you become more righteous. Now, I usually don't pray for people this way. <laughs> Especially when I think about the people who I, I care about most and I'm going to applaud and praise these people and I'm going to say, I'm going to be praying for you. Um, these are usually not the things that I, I think about. These are usually not the things that I pray for people. Uh, that's just not what typically happens. That's also not what I usually ask for when I say, hey, can you pray for me? I recently had, you know, a big uh, job interview and I, was, and I was asking people and I was saying, hey, can you pray for me? And I, this is not what I asked. I was not asking like, hey, help me be more loving on this trip. Help me have a better sense of discernment so that I make the right choices here. I'm praying for favor, for God's favor, that God will bless me in this. That's not what he's praying for. He's saying, I care deeply about you. And, and, but what he doesn't pray for, he doesn't go on and say, I pray that God will make your life easier. He doesn't say, I pray that God gives you some special favor in your life, that you would just be full of these blessings in your life, that whatever hardship you're dealing with right now, that God would just make that easier. Whatever persecution or trial or whatever you're facing right now, that God would just make that easier for you so you could go back on to living a simpler, peaceful life. I pray that you get the job. I pray that your, your church would grow. I pray that, or whatever it is that the church of Philippi was needing, instead, his prayer is his directed on them becoming more useful. I pray that you would become more loving, that you would be equipped with a better discernment, that you would be, have, have, be more righteous, the righteousness that comes from Jesus. Stop and evaluate. I can't help for myself to stop and evaluate, but stop and evaluate your prayers, and I would even say your ambitions, because sometimes our prayers are linked with our ambitions. The things we pray about often are the things that we're, we're striving for. Do I pray more for God to give me things 
to get me something, to get me somewhere, for God to invade and change my circumstances? Am I praying that God would make my life easier? Or do I pray more that God would make me more useful, make me more loving, make me more righteous, show me more sacrifices I can make? Do you pray that God makes your life easier? Would you rather pray to make your God, God, for God to make your life more easy? Or would you rather pray that God make your life more purposeful? And I appreciate the um, NLT's translation, the New Living uh, Translation. There's a very subtle word difference in these last couple of verses, and, I, and we got them on the screen here. It says, I pray, this is verses 9 and 10, it says that I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding, for I want you to understand what really matters. His prayer is that they might understand what really matters in life. And that is the question I want us to consider and wrestle with this morning. Do we have the right idea of what really matters in life? When you think and you evaluate, what am I putting my attention on right now in a 24-hour period of time? What am I putting my attention on throughout the week? What are my ambitions? What are my worries? What are my concerns? What am I focusing on? If you were to stop and ask yourself, what makes today a success? And if you were to come up with a list of things that you could put on there. So if this happens, if this happens, and this happens, that would make today a success. Or what would make this year a success? You think 2022, what makes 2022 a good year? Well, here are some things that I hope would happen. For me, for my family, whatever. Right? And you think about that list of stuff. Are those things you're focusing on, are they good? Are they the right things to focus on? Consider the gospel. And as we consider the gospel, what it is, what it means, what it says about where we come from and where we are going, think about your goals, your plans, your worries, your thoughts, your actions, your strategies, your ambitions. Do they line up with what you believe about the gospel? Does your ambitions match your convictions? Does your ambitions, right? Your ambitions are the things, that they're your goals, your plans, the things you want. They're even, your ambitions is what drives your worries, right? Because the things you're worried about are often connected with the things you're, you, you have an ambition for, right? If you're focused on, on pleasing people and making everyone else happy, you're going to be worried about saying the wrong thing or upsetting people. If your ambitions are in your career, then you're worried about things going wrong with your career. If your ambition is in your, your self-image and how people perceive you, then you're worried about how you're perceived and whether you're perceived as successful or not. These are your ambitions. Do your ambitions match your beliefs, your convictions, your hope in Jesus, your belief about who God, God is and who we are before him? And this morning, I want to unpack that question for us. Um, our worldview is what determines what we think is important. Our worldview determines what we think is important. And, and, and if you kind of look at what, what determines our worldview, as scholars will often say, oh, it's, it's these four big questions that kind of determine what our worldview is in life. Right, these four big questions, right? First question is, is, where do we come from? And that's like on a cosmic scale, right? <laughs> like where do we, as, as the human race, where do we as existence, as a universe, where do, where do we come from? What's our history? Not like, oh, I come from Poway. Not like on a cosmic scale, right? Uh, why are we here? Right, not here in this morning at church, but like why, as, 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 you know, why, why do our people exist? Why am I alive? Why am I here? Where are we going? What happens in a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a million years from now? Where, what's the trajectory? And then those three questions kind of form this last question. How, how should we live? What is good? What is right? What is the right way to live? Uh, different worldviews have different answers to those questions. So whether you're a Christian or an atheist or a Buddhist, 
Confucius, Taoist, Hindu, Muslim, Jew, whatever, right? You will have different answers to these questions. And we as Christians, the gospel, the message of Jesus, answers these four questions for us. We talk about where do we come from? We do not believe we are an accident. We do not believe that this universe, that this vast amount of complex, precise, physical laws, that this isn't just an accident. We don't believe that this is an accident. We are not the effect of some random, cold, meaningless, cosmic belch that just birthed us into existence. We believe we are intentionally and we are purposefully created by a loving God. And scripture is full with this message that this loving God created you and yearns for relationship with you. Wants to know you and wants you to know him. Why are we here? Right, a part of that, when you understand where we come from, we also understand that God, a loving God, purposely formed you for a purpose. For, he created you for a purpose. And scripture shows us that God made us for a perfect purpose, a part of his perfect plan for all of human race. You fit, you, you're a piece in that plan. Right, you were not meant to just survive. But you were meant to thrive in the plan and the purpose that God has for you. God has a vision. He has a hope. He has a dream for you. And to the question where we are going, the gospel shows us that out of the abundance of God's selfless and unconditional love, he ransomed us from our own sin and he has destined us for eternity with him. That we get to spend our eternal life lives, loving and being loved, enjoying and being enjoyed by God. No death, no pain, no sorrow awaits us in our eternity with him. And how shall we live? Jesus painted a very clear standard that our purpose is intertwined with this standard. These two ambitions, love God and love people. And this is maybe the thing we have the most control of in our life. And we might be choose to be people who live and break away from the purpose that God intended for us. Or we might be people who live out the purpose that God intended for us. That we would be people who love God and love others. Our very purpose is intertwined into that. It is a life, right? Our purpose is that we live out a life that is focused on loving God and loving people. Now, you might think through these four questions, and if you think through these four questions deeply and on your own, and you think about them in the light of Scripture as well, it is going to help you put in perspective what really matters to you. What really matters? Objectively, what really matters are the things that I worry about Today, the things that I will worry about this week, are they really worth worrying about when I consider the full depth of the gospel? Are my worries worth worrying about when I consider the full depth of the gospel? Um, 10,000 years from now, when you have died and have been promoted to heaven, are you going to look back and are you going to be proud about the things that you spent time worrying about? Are you going to be like, oh man, I'm so glad I was worrying about that doctor appointment. I'm so glad I was worrying about that little three-year run with inflation. I'm so glad I was worrying about that job interview. 10,000 years from now, are you going to look back and think like, yep, that was time well spent. I just added value to my eternity. Um, I look back at the things that I worried about 10 years ago, and I think it's funny. I look at the things, the ambitions I had, and the goals I had, and the things that I was worrying about, and I'm like, I cannot believe I spent that much energy being fussy about that 10 years ago. Anyone relate to that? 10 years ago, you, you might think your goals, ambitions, your fears, your worries, eh, a little silly, right? I can't imagine how I will look back at myself 10,000 years from now and laugh. 
about the things that I worry about, that the things that I put and made priorities. Uh, I, I'm one of those people who uh, overthink buying anything in life. Right, like whenever I buy something, I, I spend so much time thinking about it and, and asking and worrying, and I, I kind of like start to hyperventilate when I'm buying something, even if it's something really small. Right? And that's because I'm like worried about money, but I'm worried about making a mistake. Right, like the mistake is a bigger, is more important to me than, than the money or whatever. Right, and it's even with really small things. Just really recently, uh, I went on to, to buy one of those magnets for dishwashers that say "clean" or "dirty." You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I probably went on Amazon four or five different times, browsing through all the selections and asking myself and freaking out over these little stupid things, right? Like, I'm like, man, is this, is this the right shape? Is this the right size? You know, Amazon has that, like, feature where it says, like, how will it fit in your room, right? And you get, like, I don't know, you take, like, a picture and it shows you what it looks like. And I was on the dishwasher, like, how big is this going to be? We have a, we have a, a, a our, our youngest, Lewis, right? He's just kind of starting to crawl and stand up, and he, he's really handsy now. And the more fun things are to play with, the more he wants to touch with it. And so I saw some of these magnets are like slide style, and I'm like, oh yeah, that won't work. Because he'll go up and slide it back and forth, and now we don't know if it's dirty or clean anymore. Right? Does it fit with the, the feng shui of the kitchen? Right? We got like Disney stuff all over. Is it going to fit? Does it have the right font? Is it too fun? Is it too boring? <laughs> you know how much those things cost? They're like six bucks. And I, and I honestly, probably almost a collective, collection of like an hour of like looking at this. It was ridiculous, right? And you might think, well, that's ridiculous, Philip. You just don't have real problems. Well, true. That is not a real problem. But part of what, part of what I want us to consider this morning is this, is that when we look back 10,000 years from now, when we look back at this, are we going to think that the things we worried about, the things we thought about, the things that we obsessed about, the things that we, we got all pent up and built up about, are those real problems when we're in heaven? Are those going to be the things where we're like, oh yeah, that was a good thing to worry about. That was worth it. Are you going to look back and are you going to laugh? Right, in the same way that I could look back and laugh. I'm like, just, just should have bought that magnet. I, I shouldn't have spent two, more than like two minutes making that decision and just laugh about it. In light of eternity, in light of the gospel, in light of Jesus, I would argue that the only, the things that matter most in life are those things that have an eternal impact. The things that right now we do that are going to affect us and others in the kingdom of God 10,000 years from now. And I think that really what that comes down to. Are you leading a life that draws you, me, those around you, others in your life closer to Jesus? Are you leading a life that is drawing others closer to Jesus? Those are the things that matter most. The things we look back on 10,000 years from now and what we might feel more tension over and we look back on and we consider and we wonder why. Some things like this, right? Why did you choose to hang on to that grudge for so long? Rather than just Follow the way of Jesus and forgive. And show that love of Jesus, right? Um, why did I not invest more into teaching the next generation about Jesus? Our children, our youth, that is the season when they are figuring out what matters to them. And they're figuring out what they believe about life. That is the best time we can invest into the next generation. We will get the best bang for our buck in that. All right, why didn't I spend more time, energy, money, resources into building the kingdom of God? Why did I spend so much time fighting over such stupid things and creating conflicts with people and tension, going on Facebook during the presidential election season and just hashing on the keyboard in anger? 
Why did I spend so much time pushing people away from Jesus? Because I I failed to show them the love of Jesus. Why did I spend so much time making fights over silly things? So I ask, do your ambitions match your convictions? Do the things you care about, the things that you are prioritizing, their goals in life, do your ambitions match your convictions, the things that you believe about what really matters? Do they line up? Do they match? And it isn't just about worrying. I know I've talked about worrying. It's more than that. The gospel doesn't just change our worries. It changes our priorities. It changes our priorities. When we really consider uh, all of what the gospel is, the whole message of Jesus, right? Uh, It'll change what we want. It's going to change our goals. It's going to change what we value. It'll change our priorities. Um, Some of the shortest parables that Jesus taught, I think, are the most profound. And so I actually, there's two parables uh, I want to read real quick. This comes up in three verses. It's in Matthew 13, 44 through 46. This This is what Jesus said. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his, in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had, and bought it. Uh, G- Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven... That's uh, God's truth, his presence, his rule and reign over the lives of us here, here. That the full power of the gospel, the heart of Jesus' teachings, it's like this buried treasure. It's like this, this great pearl that when you, when you figure out what it is, when you understand what it means, and when you understand the impact it has on life, not just here, but 10,000 years from now, when you understand all that it is, you will realize it is worth selling everything for. It's worth giving everything up for. The gospel is worth giving up everything for. Jesus, trusting Jesus, is worth giving up everything for. This is fundamentally a lesson on investing. All right, because when, when we learn and understand what the gospel is, what God offers, when we, when, we, when we understand how valuable it is to fully trust Jesus with our lives, we realize that Jesus is the greatest investment we can ever make. He is the thing that is the most important to us and is the thing we should invest most into. Jesus is worth giving up everything else Four, nothing else matters when we have Jesus. Imagine if you could go back and give yourself advice 20 years ago on some investing tips. I guess it's kind of what Jesus is doing. Jesus is kind of looking ahead for us and saying, hey guys, this is what matters in the end. Right? This is what you should invest in. Well, imagine right now if you could look back and you go give yourself uh, investing tips 20 years ago, right? I would tell myself, sell everything out, sell my car, right? everything, and go all in on Amazon. Right? Go all in on Amazon. Check out this graph. This is the 20 year scope of Amazon from about 2000 to 20 years past. I think, I think it goes to, it's like 2017 or something like that. Right, and you just see how that skyrockets, right? And in the article, it says like, hey, if you had $1,000, if you invested $1,000 into Amazon back in 2000, you would have about 500,000 20 years later. That's an insane return of investment. It's just insane, right? If you knew that then, 20 years from now, like 20 years ago, you knew that, you can come back, if God came out and said, invest in Amazon. <laughs> and he showed you this graph, wouldn't you go all in? Wouldn't you go all in? Isn't that effectively what Jesus is saying? This is literally the point that Jesus is making when, when, he, when he talks about the parable of the mustard seed. Right? We don't have it on the screen here, but in the parable of the mustard seed, right? what does he say? He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's really, really small now. It's this really small thing. You plant it, 
when you invest in it, it becomes one of the largest plants in your garden. Those things can get big and they spread like crazy. Right? This little thing, it's worth investing in because it will pay off. Jesus is the better version of Amazon stock. There's no dips. There's no, there's no uh, plateaus. There's no decline in growth value. There's no, it is the most recession-proof stock we can invest in. Right? Uh, yet, we're pretty obsessed with what's right in front of us. We're pretty obsessed with what's right in front of us, right? We're thinking about what's right here, right in front of us. Like, this is the stuff that matters right here. I'm looking at my life in 2020. I'm scared to put $500 somewhere else. And we're looking at the ups and downs here, and we're, we're so absorbed. And maybe we don't say that our life here and now is what's most important, but a lot of us behave like it is. And if you look about how we worry, our worries often sh- reveal that we, we care so much about this, right? Uh, to continue with this analogy of investing, imagine that like investing in our physical life, our material things, it's kind of like Blockbuster back in 2000. Here's another graph. This is Blockbuster, Right? And we're like, if you look at those first couple of years in two, around the early 2000, right? You kind of see those ups and downs. And that's like us, like we're looking at that and we're excited when we get those up moments. We're like, yay, I just bought a house. Yay, I just got that new job. Oh no, my 401k. Oh, inflation. And we're just up and down, just riding that. So infatuated with those little ups and downs. But the inevitable fall is coming. That giant dip, plateau, to the point where it's just worth nothing. Um, If you look at human history in the last 10,000 years, I think pretty much every single person, there's some exceptions, but pretty much every single person would agree that this body, your body, its destiny should be no surprise. We know, I mean, we know what's going to happen here, right? And to beat around the bush, but everyone dies. <laughs> everyone has died, right? And so this physical body that we obsess over, it's, it's, this, it's, it's this inevitable, it's inevitable falls coming. And, and in 2000, the year 2000, if you could go back and tell yourself what to invest in, sell Blockbuster and buy Amazon, right? If you could look back in 20 years and you could give yourself some investing advice, and that's Jesus' message. It's fundamentally what Jesus' message here. He isn't talking about stock and money, though. He isn't talking about, uh, um, oh, you know, how you're going to get more monetary value, right? He's talking about your life. And he's saying, don't invest and the things, don't just spend your life making your highest priorities the things here on earth. And he literally says, don't, don't put your treasure into things that will rust, rot, and decay. It won't last. Put your treasures in things that will last for eternity. The kingdom of God, and the message of Jesus, the gospel, it's like a buried treasure. And when we figure it out, when we uncover it and we see what it's worth and we know what it's going to be worth in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, and 10,000 years, when we understand and we grasp the fullness of what that treasure is worth, we realize it's worth selling everything in order to get it, to acquire it, to own it. It's worth investing our life into. It's that valuable. It's worth going all in Two, the gospel is the most important conviction we have in life. And it's the conviction that, that God made us, that God loves us, that he created you and he has a destiny for you, and he wants you to trust him with everything. He wants you to trust him with everything. Even if you're in prison, even in the midst of a global pandemic, a few steps away from a nuclear war, in the midst of a family fight or feud or conflict, if 
if you'll just lost your job or you can't find a job or your 401k is a mess, whatever it is, trust Jesus. Invest in Jesus. Invest in following him, obeying him, learning from him. If you share this conviction that Jesus is who he said he was and that the gospel is true, it will flip your life upside down. It should change your worries and change your ambitions. And so I ask, do your ambitions, do the things you want in life, do your goals you have in life, when you think about what, does, what will make 2022 a success, when you think about your ambitions, do, your, do they match your convictions? Do they match your hope? In Jesus, do they match your hope in the gospel? I actually think Paul's prayer is an incredibly generous one. He said, I pray that God helps you understand what really matters in life so that you would actually spend your life investing it in the things that really matter so that you would stop prioritizing things that don't matter And you could fully commit, you could fully invest in the things that do. I pray that you would sell Blockbuster and buy Amazon. Because 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, you're going to say that was worth it. I shared this with the youth recently. Now, one of the most uh, challenging things I think I've ever read, it was, uh, I read it from Francis Chan. I know he wasn't the first to say it. One of the most challenging things I've ever read was, was this quote. And it's something that sticks with me and stuck with me for you know, 10, 15 years. It says, our greatest fears shouldn't be a failure, but succeeding at the wrong things. Right? Uh, who cares if you succeed if your goals suck? Right? Uh, who, who cares if you're the best at something if, if it doesn't matter? I'm the best at this game I just made. Better than you. In your face. Nobody cares. Right? And you're not going to care 20 years from now, 100 years from now. What a waste if you spend your life succeeding at ambitions that don't really matter. And that's what Paul's prayer is. That you would know What ambitions really matter? Perhaps the best things that we actually can pray for ourselves, for our kids, for our families, for our friends, for our church, for our city, for our country, for our allies, and for our enemies isn't for safety, isn't for world peace, isn't for comfort, isn't for an easier life. And not to say those things we can't or shouldn't pray. I'm just saying the first thing the most important thing we can pray for, the most generous thing we can pray for is that we would know what the right purpose is, that we would live out a life with the right purpose. Perhaps our first prayer should be that God helps us better understand what really matters in life and he would help us get there. Let's pray that our convictions about Jesus, about the gospel, will properly properly determine our ambitions. That our belief about Jesus will determine our ambitions, our goals, our worries, our hopes, and our dreams. That our goals and our priorities will be changed and shaped by the gospel we believe in. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for this time, God. I pray and I ask, God, that you just shape us, you mold us, you transform us this morning, Lord. You do what only you can do and that your word actually takes root in our heart. That we would reconsider our life, we would evaluate what really matters to us, and we would fix our goals, our ambitions, our trajectory in life to be one that aligns with you and your purpose and your kingdom for us and your, and, your, and your destiny for us. 
God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your affection. Thank you for the grace that we find in the gospel. Thank you for Jesus. And I thank you for this church, Lord, and I ask that you bless it. God, that you would help each one of us figure out what really matters. Amen.